Well, hello, everybody, and welcome once again. It's a great pleasure to introduce my friend Richard Casebo from Edinburgh. Um, as we said in the invitation letter, he's combining personal construct theory and the Alexander technique and has been practicing both of those for many years. And I think his integration of those is a highly original project. Richard is extraordinarily perceptive and can read from clients' postures and their movements, their eyes, their head direction, etc., how they are construing or something about how they're construing, which is fascinating. And that obviously we all know about sort of unconsciously, but uh, perhaps we take it for granted a little bit. We can massively underestimate how much construing is expressed and communicated through bodily movement which gives a lie, I think, to so much dependency on language in the verbal and contemporary theorizing. We know this from much that we can get on with people in any part of the world with a minimum of words. Richard will conduct us in this, face, uh, in this fascinating world, focusing on the sequencing and coordination of movement in our conduct and in our relating. So great pleasure to see you, Richard, and we're looking forward to your talk very much. Thanks. Thank, thank, thank you, Harry. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Ah, so as, as usual, when one does these things, one gets round to preparing the talk and one looks at the abstract one's written and thinks, what was I going to actually do? Um, so I'm, what follows is quite conversational. I'm want to start with an invitation. Um, Joseph Campbell in Myths We Live By talked about a Japanese aristocratic language where the, you would say to somebody who was visiting um, Tokyo, I see that you're playing at visiting Tokyo, or if they heard your father was dead, I see that here that your father is playing at being dead. I would invite you to play at being at this workshop. Um, <laughs> I'm certainly playing at giving a workshop. And um, with that also to, um, to use a phrase of Kelly's is, is to enter a world of make-believe. And it's a world of make-believe in terms of Kelly's psychology being incredibly embodied. It really is about a person being a form of motion. There are going to be a few shortest quotes from mainly from Miller Mayer and John Dewey and the rest of the time I will talk. In that talking I'll talk about my experience as an Alexander Technique teacher and what I do and a little bit about how I understand the Alexander Technique and then there will be two breakout rooms um, where I'll invite you to go and look at uh, what one can do with the face of decision one and then um, to look at the whole question of posture, for those of you who are psychotherapists, psychologists who work with people, there is the whole question around posture, what does it mean, uh, which we'll get to. So, um, I'm not an academic. There's a construct that Hans Zimmer used where he contrasts uh, academics with dilettantes. I am definitely a dilettante. I take delight in the immediacy of the image as it uh, emerges. And this I think is very close to what Miller Mayer was getting at when he invited us to act as if um, uh, using the metaphor for community of selves to act as if we were a community of selves. And this whole workshop is based on the fact that we are an extended community of selves into which I'm inviting John Dewey and Miller to say some things, um, really to help the scene for the two breakout rooms. And there'll be a couple of times I share my screen and that will be the order of the day. So, Going forward a little bit further, um, how did I come to Kelly? Um, well, it's quite simple. I, I was teaching people um, and I realized Alexander's technique. Um, 
a technique for what? Uh, it's, I think it's a technique for constructive conscious control. And I'll talk again a little bit later about what that might actually mean. And I noticed that people were not using Aristotelian logic. And I also noticed that you could go, Alexander has a thing called guiding orders or directions where he talks about uh, your head going forward and up rather than back and down. And I noticed that you could actually, um, different people attach completely different meanings to what those small movements might be. And that they got quite philosophical really rather quickly. And I, I'd set myself the task of um, writing a theory of how people abstracted information and um, worked with habits. And then I came across Kelly and I realized somebody had done it before me and probably much better than I could ever attempt to do. So I ended up phoning up um, Peggy Dalton and said, I, listen, I've just read this chap's book. Uh, are you doing anything? Um, Peggy was a bit surprised that anybody had actually read the two volumes um, at that point uh, and when they phoned up. And then I got into doing the training and trained to be a, a personal construct psychotherapist. And looking back, preparing this, I realized actually that I was really, the things that I thought whenever that was 18 years ago, really just, I've just elaborated them further. Um, over those 18 years and that's a bit about what I'm going to talk about today but first I'd like to do a little bit of scene setting using Miller Mayer so I'm just going to share my screen uh, there we go so oh we don't want to be on that do we to venture personally is often lonely and unsupported sometimes actively resisted by others. You're likely to lose your familiar contact with segments of social reality, which has served to keep you in some recognizable space in the social geography of others and yourself. The venture personally can be a demanding, painful, exciting, frightening thing to do. It can be so because on this frontier, everything is new again and again, always new. You cannot shield or prepare yourself with the armaments of yesterday. When the next step is taken, you're again naked at the beginning, unsophisticated on your own. And that I think has got a lot to do with what optimal functioning is about. It's a return to the here and now. And that is something that I think uh, Alexander's work is an invitation to do. Um, and again, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that later. And so, um, Another quote from Miller, and we're inviting Miller into our community of selves here, to engage in personal inquiries, to give effort and attention to finding your own voice, voice rather than falling in behind someone else's bandwagon of the moment. My impression is that many want to remain in hiding out of the firing line of social dis disapproval. We tend to follow current trends rather than give ourselves over to becoming what is possible for us and perhaps no one else. And finally, Kelly emphasizes the fluid, changing nature of the psychological processes, which constitute whatever, whatever we are, sorry, I'm just got a technical problem here at my end. Okay, sorry. Technical problem here. But then we come to Epicus. Don't explain your philosophy, embody it. My question is, but how? Sorry about that. So yes, the thing is, all philosophies actually, for me, are philosophies that are incarnate in the way we move. That's part of the whole thing about a person being a form of motion. And one of the things I'm going to 
uh, talk about um, as we go is when we get to the face of decision. How um, I'm just going to sketch it very loosely how, how, how that might apply to Jung's work, how it might apply to Heidegger, um, how um, it might apply to Kelly's recommendations for the posture of a psychotherapist. And then part of my invitation will be for you to go and think about your own philosophies and how you embody them. How do you incarnate your superordinate constructs in Kellyan language? And to get there, we're going to, I'm just going to share the screen and I'm going to um, read some quotes from John Dewey and then that'll be most of the quotes done for the day. First of all, this is this is a quote that um, is a very excellent uh, article called The Posture of Anticipation uh, by David Mills. Uh, David has done a lot of work on the links between Dewey, Kelly and Alexander. And there's this lovely quote in there from Dewey. My theory is a mind body of the coordination of the active elements of the self and of the place of ideas of inhibition and control of activities required contact with the work of FM Alexander and in later years his brother AR to transform them into realities. And this is actually, this is what uh, in one of uh, something that uh, Dewey wrote and he's referring, the friend he's referring to is Alexander. Recently, a friend remarked to me that there was no one, one superstition current among even cultivated persons. They suppose that if one is told what to do, if the right end is pointed, pointed out to them, all that is required in order to bring about the right act is will or wish on the part of the one who is to act. He used as an illustration the matter of physical posture. The assumption that if a man is told to stand up straight, all that is further needed is wish and effort on his part, and the deed is done. He pointed out that this belief is on par with primitive magic in its neglect of attention to the means which are involved in reaching an end. And he went on to say that the prevalence of this belief, starting with false notions about the control of the body and extending to the control of the mind and character, is the greatest bar to intelligent social progress. It bars the way because it. So I'm missing a slightly bit of my screen, which is why I'm having trouble reading this. And he went on to say that the prevalence of this belief, starting with the false notions about control of the body and extending to control of the mind and character, is the greatest bar to intelligent social progress. It bars the way away because it makes us neglect intelligent inquiry to discover the means which will produce the desired result, an intelligent intervention to procure the means. In short, it leaves out the importance of intelligently controlled habit. Now, one of the things that if you look at the definitions that Dewey use has of habit and Alexander use of habit, they're more or less the same. And they are basically how Kelly describes the construct. So when I'm thinking about my work, I often think in terms of habit construct. What Kelly offers me, though, is a very strong theoretical way to work with habits in hierarch hierarchical systems. And it also has, because uh, constructs are bipolar, it answers a lot of the problems that I was looking at when I first was looking at thinking about writing my own feeling of theory of abstraction. And then one last quite long bit from Dewey. The same considerations define the subconscious of human thinking. Apart from language, from imputed and inferred meaning, we continue to engage in immense multitudes of immediate organic selections, rejections, welcomings, expulsions, appropriations, withdrawals, shrinkings, expansions, 
relations and ejections, attacks warding off for the most minute vibrating nature. We are not aware of the qualities of many or most of these acts. We do not objectively distinguish and identify them. Yet they exist as feeling qualities and have enormous directive effect on our behavior. He then goes on to talk a little bit about standing and finishes off saying, they gave us our sense of rightness and wrongness of what to select and follow up and what to drop, slur over and ignore. Among the multitude of incohate meanings that are presenting themselves. They give us premonitions of approach to acceptable meanings and warnings of getting off the track. Formulated discourse is mainly but a selected statement of what we wish to retain among all these incipient starts, following ups and breakings off. Except as a reader, a hero repeats some of these organic movements and thus gets their qualities. He does not get the sense of what is said. He does not really assent, even though he could give called appropriation. These qualities are the stuff of intuitions. And in actuality, the difference between an intuitive person and an analytic person is a matter of degree of relative emphasis. The reasoning person is one who makes his intuitions more articulate, more deliverable in speech, as an explicit sequence of initial premises, jointures, and conclusions. And then a little quote from Kelly just to make sure that he gets a voice. The posture of anticipation, which is the identifying psychological feature of life itself, silently forms questions and earnest questions erupt in actions. One can also think of James's uh, spiritual self, what he called the self of self, which is all the little movements of the throat. And one of the things here is that I'm going to, there'll be a couple of quotes from Kelly later on, is that all these little movements can be looked at. They have meanings. They form sequences of action, uh, sequences of action preparation. And we are, and I think Kelly is an ideal philosophy for being able to elaborate and work with these habitual patterns of movement, which for many people are pre-verbal, non-verbal, below their levels of consciousness. Uh, Alexander's technique is a way of bringing those habits to consciousness. Um, now, his technique is, a, is as I said earlier, is it's a technique for the developing of what he would have called constructive conscious control. I wouldn't recommend reading Alexander. They're quite difficult books to read. Um, constructive conscious control has two aspects, one of which I think is highly useful, and the other where Alexander mistakes his own personal constructions uh, um, and constructive conscious control becomes the way rather than just a way of exploration, a way of elaboration, a way of being with movement, rather like uh, Hillman's uh, of, of chemical psychology is a way just for being with the images and Miller Mayer's community of selves is a way to see the purity of each member of your community of selves. So this is about developing an attitude of embodied mind to your own ongoing experience as it occurs. And this is something that I think we're working with all the time. And as Chewy said, um, very often when people, I, I, one of the things I often say to people who come to work with me is, is that when they're talking about how they've talked with their friends and their friends have given them some, some advice, and I point out I, if they could do it, they would have done it by now. People only come and seek help um, because they can't get to the how of what they might want to do, how they might want to act. Um, there needs to be a clearing space. Um, and this brings to Alexander's technique, which is real two parts. The first part is what he called inhibition, and it's the ability to stop, to put aside. In Heidegger's language, later, later Heidegger, Heidegger that, that is, it's the clearing. And it's the clearing, and I'll get this, tie this right down to the face of decision, which we're going to get to. 
And it's a clearing of a certain type of response to things that are happening in your world. And if there's a model of child development by Stanley Greenstam, which I'm very fond of, which he talks about the child's uh, first job, his first task is to learn to downregulate. And in the building of mind, um, it's this ability to stop. And I'm going to tie this down to what happens if we inhibit, to use Alexander's technique, uh, the face of decision, or we carry on with it. And you get to the face of decision. Face of decision is um, something that is a phrase of Alain de Thos, who's a French neuroscientist. He just he wrote a very wonderful technical book on the head, neck, back, sensory motor system. And he, in another book on reason and emotion, he talks about the face of decision and he ties it right back to James, James Lange, a theory of emotions. And Darwin's noticing that cross-culturally people tend to tighten their corrugator muscles like that. And one of the things Berthos notes is that, that people are moving along freely in their anticipation, it's all going really well. It's going the way they want it to go. And then something happens that uh, invalidates their in anticipation of what should happen next. And they go like that. Somebody else, I can't remember who it was. I think it was John Gottman, a John Gottman lecture I watched, uh, called it what the what the fuck face. What the fuck is going on here? And when you go into the what the fuck face, if you, if you, if you all practice your what the fuck faces, uh, so a nice real furring of those corrugated muscles, then you'll notice that things happen to your breathing and you, you start to tighten in your neck muscles. So uh, James's spiritual self is getting interrupted, choked a bit and you start to tighten in your biceps and you hold your breath and you go into a pattern of fixing. And just that way of, hmm, what the fuck is, and you can attend to that and start to scan your constructs that you, your anticipations and what the implications might be of this interruption. And one of the things of Alexander's technique, which is not talked about terribly much is it's because it's partly that you've been used a lot by actors and musicians. The fact that he split he very roughly acts into physical acts and mental acts and talked about how we use ourselves, which is how we coordinate ourselves, how we coordinate ourselves, how important that it is to the act of conception. And in the act of conception, because I'm a dilettante, I want to think about the act of conceiving, the act of giving birth to new ideas. And what the fuck is not really terribly helpful to giving, giving birth to new ideas. Um, what also goes along with the face of decision, uh, which was uh, Darwin noticed with the turning to clench the jaw. So it's all, and, um, you often find that people put on very serious faces. I remember once I was involved with something and we all trooped off to meet these Glasgow lawyers uh, in their big tall glass building. And we were up in the boardroom and they all came in trying to impress us all, there were two of us. And they came in and they all had these very serious faces and holding their breath and grabbed my arm and gripping it in ways that and I, I, I was, internally I was finding it rather funny because I was wondering what, an, I was in a culture where being really tight, really serious and holding your breath was supposed to mean something. Uh, and I just thought it looked very uncomfortable. Um, and, but these kind of postural, these kind of faces, and of course you can get this very much more detailed and you can take one of the things that's come out of the trauma practices and people like Stephen Porges polyvagal theory is the way you coordinate your facial muscles travels down through your vagus nerve and affects what's going on in your heart, affects what's going on in your guts and all your internal organs. And 
So paying attention to what's going on with the muscles of the face and how they're coordinated and how they're sequenced has a profound effect on what, whether people are gripping in their hearts or gripping in their guts. And Alexander's the technique is a way of bringing this all into people's awareness to give them a choice to elaborate what the implications might be of well actually I could I could have tackled this this setback by going what the fuck or I might actually inhibit that and see what happens if I allow myself to become focused to down regulate uh, to let, bring my peripheral vision in and for me, I, I can take that straight into late Heidegger's ideas about clearings and gatherings. Um, it's also interesting I, that Jung, in a letter in 1959, in one of his definitions of God was um, anything that interrupts his path. So out there in the world for Jung, it, when he goes, what the fuck? and goes into that phase of decision to him, he was making the faces of God, whatever that might mean. Um, so there's a lot of things that come off of this. For Darwin, the clenched jaw was a sign of strength and his contrast was, was the slacked open mouth of surprise, which he thought was weak. Um, I'm telling you all this because of course, I'm going to invite you to go into a breakout room at some point and think about what these faces might mean for you. Um, I say, this is just what Jung made of it, and this is what Darwin made of it. Darwin's construct was strong versus weak, uh, between a, that kind of face and, ah. Oh. And these all have meanings. And we, if you watch people, they just go for the faces just appear as they are evaluating different things. And so one of the things I've got really interested in, in terms of sequencing, and I'm going to talk a little bit about just about teaching, and this applies, I think, also to therapy, is in Alexander's work, Alexander's traditionally taught with a lot of hands-on. I, I can teach verbally without my hands. Um, and the idea is to give people a contrast experience, because when it comes to how you coordinate yourself, a lot of people come for things like back pain and a lot of people think of Alexander as work in terms of posture. And you get this thing about if people try and stand up straight, they do this and then they go like that. And it's, it, 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 that's their way of trying to control their movement and they, it doesn't really work. So if you give them an experience of standing differently, that goes back to the Dewey quote, where they are balancing. Human beings move best when they're unstable but balancing. And if you're taking movements like running or sports or martial arts, what's happening with the head neck is actually really allows that balancing while being unstable to occur. I'm getting a lot of somebody sounds like typing. So if you're typing, can you just mute? And thank you. Um, the, um, so there's a lot of actually about you putting your hands on to give somebody a very different experience of how they might coordinate themselves, but just something simple as type standing. And when people have the new experiences, they immediately, of course, want to evaluate. They want to complete this experience cycle. And that's when they immediately want to go back to try use their old habits. So you give them a new experience and then they immediately oh, are going to, I need to evaluate that using my old habits, which of course immediately loses whatever you've just given them. So when I'm working as an Alexander technique, you know, this translates into being a therapist as well. But it is an, one of the things that's really important is to give people a new experience of what Alexander called the physical act, but also the mental act, in order to give them a complete cycle of experience. And in doing that, you're also once working with all the time with what Pollyani, and Mila Mayer was very into Pollyani, Pollyani and uh, you're working with the from to structure, the or the UNI structure of uh, John McMurray. 
And one of the things that I'm very interested in is, and really got me into Kelly, was this, his idea of sociality, which is that we are making sense of other people. We are people, people in relationship. And John McMurray was a Scottish philosopher whose work very nicely parallels a lot of what's in Kelly. He is also a lot of the relational turn that then happened in psychology. People like Travathian and Daniel Stern um, all refer back to McMurray's lecture, Gifford lectures that he did in Edinburgh in the 50s. And McMurray was a bit like Bibber in that he thought there was something very important about you and I. Boomer, of course, said I thou. One of the interesting things, and you can play with this, is that when people go I thou in English, I think it's probably different in German. But when people in English go I thou, they immediately look at themselves. They go I thou as if it's a gift. Whereas when you go you and I, you make the I that's attending is actually the subsidiary term. And that's one of the things that Pogliani talks about is that our awareness of self is subsidiary to what we're attending to. And when we're attending in interpersonal relationships, when we're looking to construe the construction processes of the other person, well, they are the dominant term, especially if we're in the role of a therapist or an Alexander Technique teacher. We're looking to subsume and understand where they're coming from within our own professional constructs. And I'm going to talk, the relevance of this will come up later. Um, hopefully it will make sense when we get to the second of the breakout rooms. So all of this is very embodied for me because it's about getting into a receptive place in order to actually allow for the mirroring, this which Dewey is talking about there, which we do at some level, we mirror, we take on the movement patterns of the people that we've been talking to us. And of course they take on our patterns as well. One of the things I do an awful lot of teaching just by standing in front of people and role playing and they follow them. And yesterday, I, well, this week, I've had a very lovely experience of somebody who just absolutely blossomed because they quite intentionally mirrored me and you can see them just coming out of a very place of pain into something that's much much freer. Mirroring is a very powerful tool and it's um, how one sits, how one is with people has a huge effect on how they are and how they are is very much shows up in the, the coordination of breath so one of the things that's here with Alexander's inhibition, this technique has two formal parts. There's inhibition and direction. I'm just going to talk about inhibition and I'm going to talk a little bit more about direction. And then we'll look to move towards the first breakout room. So inhibition is a stopping of whatever your normal habits are so that you're actually start to, your breathing starts to release and you start to lengthen in stature. It's a, thing, a way of non-doing. It's about knowing what's getting in the way of that happening. Alexander makes the assumption that if you stop the doing the wrong things, the right things will tend to happen. And you see this, if you just get people, all these little movements that Jude was talking about, People make all these movements, they pull off center, they pull out of their center. Everything comes up out of their center into, onto their balcony. They tighten their necks and they cut themselves off from, split themselves into a mind and a body. As far as I can work out, that mind and body is just a coordination thing that involves a lot of tightening in your neck. If you're working as a self, coordinating yourself, using yourself, um, then it's the whole of your, it's the relationship between your head, your neck and then back that's important as it responds and everything. What Alexandra does, it gives you an awareness of that. And 
it ties very much, I think, into Kelly's core role. In that Kelly's core role, the character of the core role has a coordination. It's the coordination that you evolve in or as if your life depends on it when you're growing, growing up. We are born as personal political scientists. And I, I kind of changed that a little bit in my own head recently, uh, having done a workshop with Colwyn Trevathian when he was getting rather excited by the idea of babies as politicians. And I thought, you know, it's absolutely right. We are, we, we are born, and what are we concerned with? We're concerned about who's in, who's out, and am I getting my fair share? Um, and politics starts right as, as soon as we're it, it, from one of the uh, uh, we did a, there was a workshop in the series where we were talking about how twins are relating in in the womb you know politics yeah. is there right at the start i'm getting this no you're not and so as personal political scientists um we're evolving these coordinations and again one of the things that was fascinating in that workshop was the idea that in the womb we were seeing these coordinations which were the same coordinations as uh, highly skilled athletes one of the things that's there is that if you allow you see in babies and young children is they often develop developing really beautiful patterns of movement until they go to school they have to they're taught to concentrate when they're bored and all these layers of habits constructs build up and this is what you meet as an Alexander technique teacher is what you meet as a psychotherapist as people have all these patterns of movements that are habitual constructs and that they have patterns of meaning and they have evolved in relationship to the people who were there as validators invalidators as they grow up so there is, I, in construct terms, um, yeah, I just, there's just, just, actually, I think I might share this slide because I think it, it, it's the heart of what I want to say. So this is just, just one slide. Um, and that is the animation is the ground of the experiment. It provides the field of ongoing knowing. If we're not animated, actually, how can we be experimenting? It, it really provides the field of ongoing knowing. And there is no separation between a person being a form of motion and construing. Personal movement is the condition of construing and personal movement is itself personally construed forming a source of knowledge from which we attend to while being aware of. Not only as after the, the last one of these is an adaption is taken from Maxine Sheets to Johnston's Primacy of Movements. I've adapted it slightly. It's not only as our construing of the world everywhere and always animated, but our movement is everywhere and always kinesthetically informed. In other words, it's always coordinated. There's always a relationship within ourselves um, about how the parts of our selves, our arms, our hands, our heads, our necks, our tongues, um, goes right to the heart. You find that people, people literally grip their heart. You can encourage them just to, to stop gripping their heart. There are lots of things that you can work with. So, I've been talking for more than enough time, and what I'm going to invite you to do is to um, actually let's have a couple of words from George himself, and then we'll go into the face of decision uh, breakout room. So we'll just do this. Uh, So George talks about thus we'll be skeptical of the value of lifting a single muscle twitch as datum from each of a thousand individuals to see what is happening psychologically. We would be more hopeful of abstracting the essential features in the, 
of in the same individual and comparing the resulting construct with abstractions similarly anchored in other individuals twitching. This means, of course, that each study in concept formation becomes a problem of concept, concept formation for the psychologist. After he has conceptualized each of his cases, he next has the task of further abstraction with individual constructs in order to produce constructs which underlie people in general. And this and the kind of data we lift from the realm of the individual has a great deal to do with the kind of generalizations we are able to make regarding groups of individuals. What we live can range all the way from the muscle twitches to philosophical systems. If we lift muscle twitches, we need only compare and contrast the muscle twitch of the person, and the muscle twitch of yonder person and so on. But if we lift this person's whole philosophical system as a single datum, we are suddenly confronted with the breathtaking task of plotting on continuing with the philosophies of other acquaintances. Does any of us have a reference access for such an undertaking? And I'm rather going to suggest um, that the face of decision might just be one of them. That the face of the decision, as Darwin said, is something that everybody has. Even your dog has it, your cat has it. Um, and I'm not, I don't think I can get to my, the philosophy of my cat, but um, I do think you can get to Heidegger's philosophy, you can certainly get to Jung's, and I suspect one can get to some of Georgie's, um, as we sort of see uh, uh, when we do the next breakout room. So what I'd like you to do, those of you who, uh, one or two people I know who are, are not PCP familiar here, uh, but those of you who are, you might like to ladder your own um, uh, face of decision, of what it means for you when you do that. Uh, what's your contrast face to doing that? So if that, you will all know that face, I would imagine. And uh, what's your contrast face to that? And which do you prefer and why? I, I, there are definitely, I, I, I went for a walk this afternoon and coming up Leith Walk in Edinburgh, um, behind me and then in front of me was this man who was rather angry. Um, and he kept good standing in the middle of the road and going, I don't point, he was certainly upset because he kept on making this gesture or, or, or wanting to cut, cut your throat. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm shouting things about wanting everybody to die. Um, now there was a man I think he was kind, kind of kind of stuck in his what the fuck attitude. Um, um, what I would like you to do is which do you prefer? What's your contrast face and why? And just just to talk amongst it yourselves for fifteen minutes. So uh, if you can put us into break it, put people into breakout rooms, that'd be great. And we'll see you in fifteen minutes. Sounds good. Uh, uh, um, um, Richard, how many people do you think should be in a breakout room that you'd uh, like? What do you suggest? Um, three people. Three? Okay. Three. Six groups. Um, is the task clear to everyone? Are we clear what the task is, people? I would quite like you, Richard, just to say, when you say the face of decision, there's quite a central thing that you've been saying. Can you just say a bit more about it? Well, it's Alan Berthel's thing, thing, which is this idea that when, when, we're, when we're moving along, and we're happily moving along, um, you could see this with this angry man is people were going, oh, what this, that was their response because their anticipation of what it would be um, to walk along. It's, it's this response, it's the what the fuck, what's going on? So when I just you like, say decision, I was, do, you, do you mean, when you say decision, do you mean a person who is making a decision and the face that they have when they're doing it or yes, it's hoping more, that it, they would? It, it, it's, the face, it's the face that happens when, it's the what the fuck face, what's gone wrong here? Okay. So it's that face. What the fuck is that? Puzzlement. 
Well, puzzlement is probably <laughs> it would, we, we could go into a whole taxonomy, which I'd be delighted to do, of different types of what the fuck face. Uh, but it's the use of the corrugator muscles of the eyes to, pro to, to produce the furrow on, on your just just as you're puzzling now. Yeah. 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 So they, you're using a face. So there you're using a face there to try and understand me. And I would ask you as if you were, if I was working with you, I would say, well, what would happen if you didn't do that? Yeah. So you could just soften there. Yeah. Here we yeah. go. And you see, you're, you're still able. You're still able to think, and you've got a lot less tension. We're back on. Great. So, so what do people make of that? What happened in the breakout rooms? Until shout at once. <laughs> it was great. We had we had a really good discussion about um, yeah about face of decision and and its contrast like. Like you suggested, um, there were three of us, and we all had slightly different contrasting poles. I'm not sure if I can do justice to everybody's, but um, I know Suzanne was um, hers was along the line of. We all had some commonality. We all, I think, had kind of openness in our contrast, but uh, Suzanne's meant more kind of compassionate and open. Um, Mine, uh, I had trouble accessing in the beginning, but got to kind of open flowing curiosity. And um, Sally, I don't know if Sally's there, but I'm sorry, I can't remember <laughs> <laughs> what you said, Sally. Maybe she's, she's not there anymore. She's okay. there at the bottom. She had, to go home. she had to go for a phone call, so she yeah. might not be back yet, but... Um, Mm -hmm. Certainly open featured for her as well, and I think Flowing did too. Yeah. Um, and uh, I suppose, yeah, we we talked a bit about how you move moving between the two and um, just how it's... We, we, we thought it was very important to find the triggers, didn't we, for our face of decision. And perhaps those are our stuck stuck areas of construing or holding a lot of tension yeah for me, um that's right and for me i i just this won't be a surprise to you richard but i found myself considering it in the context of um, climbing and kayaking because <laughs> uh, well because in a way uh, it, it's most obvious i think um mm. Yeah, the the open, curious, flowing attitude is is when it's most fun and uh, when it's all working really well. And what about when it's terrifying? Oh, Sorry. Yeah. What well, there's a, there's a fine line, I suppose, um, because both of those activities require a really high level of alertness and constant change and constant decision-making, constant things happening, and um, your best chance of um, dealing with those things is to be able to be in a open, flo flowing, curious state, as opposed to a what the fuck state. But obviously you, you can find yourself in either, I can find myself in either. And the challenge is to sort of keep the flow in the face of whatever is thrown at me. I, I, Clearly, I, I, I don't manage it all the time at all. Um, but when I do, it's it's amazing. There we are. <laughs> mm. Mm. Does anybody else want to say anything or shall we move on? Okay. We talked a little bit, Richard, about, about movements and uh, where our eyes go uh, when, when we're in these... Um, studied facial, you know, concentration of things, or in with with somebody trying to give them develop this the social relationship that we're with them and we're listening to. Them. So we talked a little bit about where our our eyes go, and we noticed it with each other, 
um, rather which was quite an on the screen rather than what one one does oneself, and um, uh, and and what those you know, and, and the connection with NLP, uh, yeah. where that the, they interpret eye movement and positioning of looking, mm. don't they? To, to has some sort of uh, linguistic meaning, um, but uh, and also at about image, you know other facial images. Mm. Sorry. Go on, Adele. Uh, I think that was it, wasn't it? Wasn't it, Sharon? The, the, those those thoughts. Mm. She's muted. You muted, Sharon. Yes, that that that, that was it. Yes, uh, I, I think a couple of us had, had uh, you know the what the fuck is up, you know, and maybe even hands, but up like that. What the hell's going on? And uh, and then the thing, well. I think I've got it, you know, mm, yeah, but that's that's not the contrast pole in a sense to the confusion it would, would be to actually being still and staying with the process and uh, keeping open to gaining new material would be the contrast for me, not just, uh, I don't understand it, yeah, I've got it, I'm with it, I know all about that, yeah. which would be to foreclose on some kind of conclusion, yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. We mentioned at one point um, about signs and semiotics and uh, the amount of stuff that's going on between us all the time at that level seems to me one of the most useful things of today's discussion is to tune us into getting much more aware of the signals that, that we have to read from others, but also the signals that we're giving out all the time. I mean, it's an incredibly <laughs> complex mm rich world of mm. interaction and communication and empathy and sociality and all the rest of it, isn't it? Mm. That rather nicely starts to lead into the next place of the workshop, um, which is, um, again, I just want a couple of quotes. Um, so. During the, almost any type of interview, the therapist should appear to be physically relaxed and mentally receptive. He should sit in the chair as if he, he expected to be there for a long time, not crouched as if he were about to spring into action. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect that George is telling us that we shouldn't be going sitting there with our clients going, what the fuck? <laughs> as they tell us about their latest experiments. And then from Erwin Yalon, um, the basic posture of the therapist to a client must be one of concern, acceptance, genuineness, and empathy. Nothing, no technical consideration takes precedence over this attitude. And I find that really interesting because uh, 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 being me, when I've already taught, I'm, I, 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 I have a way I can switch the, the, it on and off. But I have noticed that um, that uh, there are times I've met some very stressed psychotherapists um, <laughs> who embody a lot of anxiety and a lot of other things. Um, just that's how it is to me. I read things in a very particular way. And I want to then move to, to a little story about the Dalai Lama, which I found recently when after when Desmond Tutu died, I came across this. Um, when the Dalai Lama greets you, he takes your hand and the rubs it tenderly as a grandparent might. He looks into your eyes, feels deeply what you are feeling and touches your forehead to yours. Isn't that interesting in, concern, in terms of what that does to the face of decision? It's a beautiful yeah. thing. When you get that, that movement there, if you, if you get somebody, if you can notice it and you know how to talk and they release it, the profound reorganization that can happen. It's just one habit that I work with as an Alexander Technique teacher. There are other way, things that we're doing, but I just wanted to work with the talk about the face of decision today. So there he, the Dalai Lama touches your forehead, his forehead to yours. What, whatever feeling, relation or anguish is in your heart and reflected on your face is mirrored in his. But then when he next, the next, next person, those emotions are gone. He is wholly available to the next encounter and the next moment. I'm not suggesting, by the way, 
if you read this, the Dalai Lama gets up at some very early hour in the morning, engages in hours of practice to be able to do this. Um, <laughs> but it's kind of it's kind of interesting about just the skill that this takes to be able to do this. Um, and then it goes on, but perhaps that is what is meant to be fully present, available for each moment, each person we encounter, untethered by the ruminating memories of the past, and not lured by the anticipatory worry about the future. Mm. And one of the things here is about Alexander's work is the way of coming to presence. Um, it's a way of being present to whatever is going on. Um, it's conscious control. It's applicable if you're in the imaginal world of James Hillman or you're working with a uh, Millard Mayer community of selves. If you're really paying attention to the self that is present, and you're allowing yourself to see its purity, then from my point of view, you're wanting to find that quality of presence that was still talked about with the Dalai Lama there. You're wanting to find that ability to attend so your breathing is released and you're nice and poised and you're nice and balanced as you engage whichever, with, whichever member of your community of self happens to be present uh, at that particular time. And you can, of course, I, I would decenter James's self of self. That's just another member of your community. But these are all movements. They all have very particular coordination. In the breakout room I was in, somebody was talking about their sequence of faces. These are just dancing members of your community who show up on your balcony to wave to the crowds. And um, they're there one minute and they're the on the next. For Jung, I think they would just be the presence of the gods showing. Uh, for Hillman too, for Heidegger, the, 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 it's the return of the last gods. Um, this is what we're working with, I think, all the time when we become present to people. And Alexander's technique is, for me, uh, um, I, I interpersonally, this is something that I've developed in terms of as, as my own teaching practice, is very much about coming into relationship with people and that quality of present. I haven't quite managed the Dalai Lama skill yet. Um, I don't think I'm going to get there in this lifetime. I might need to be reincarnated for that several times. Um, what I'm going to invite you to do is to think, go into breakout rooms and if might, we can keep it to 15 minutes this time. Um, just again, just again to discuss about that quality of presence and how it just, Think about how you recognize um, you're accepted. If you're working with someone, how do you know that the way they are with you means that you're accepted? How do you know if you're working with a client that you're actually, the client is experiencing that acceptance? Um, I can be sitting there very relaxed, very comfortable in myself, but that doesn't mean to say that's not going to be very threatening to my client. I might need to actually do something to pick, pick them up and get them and help them find my own presence to them. Um, because being fully present can be quite a scary experience for people if they're not used to it. So really I'd like you to just spend 15 minutes talking, thinking about people who you've worked with, who've been in that kind of role where you've been looking for acceptance, whatever that might be. It could be a therapist, it could be a, could be a teacher, it could be a supervisor. Um, but also to think about and talk about how you find it, what communicates acceptance to you. Um, that, that's, that's the task. Is that, is that clear? Uh, yeah. What's your posture? What's your posture of acceptance? Um, uh, what does the relaxed posture look like? Maybe it looks like that. I don't know. It didn't look like that to me. Um, but what is the relax? What's the relaxed posture? There you go. I just so ask you can... something before. Yeah. I mean, a lot of what you've been talking about is highly visual and. Um, you know, one talks about it, but to actually see it on a video or on film would be incredibly powerful for 
getting a better understanding of this stuff. I was just wondering if there was any any material, you know, kind of on YouTube or anything like that 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 studies some of these things and actually shows it. Um, I'm not aware of it, and I wouldn't go to Alexander Technique teaching videos for this. Uh, I, if you gave me a lab, Harry, in the research grant, I would happily go and make the. I would happily go and do this research. I mean, this is but waiting I, to happen, isn't it? It's. It's. It, 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 it's uh, absolutely. I think what I find very interesting is 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 that the. the I've taken two, one sentence from Yalom's big book on therapy and one sentence from Kim Kelly's. It's such a fundamental thing, posture, whatever that, which is this relationship of parts, which is where Alexander works and how they are coordinated together in the sequence. And yet, if you actually look, Alexander technique teachers are very highly trained in that. But in terms of psychotherapists, I don't really think it's touched on in trainings. No. And yet, I, and yet, the, and yet, it, it, go back to Yalom, it's it's such a central importance and that's really what the invite is to talk talk about what do you think what communicates to you um there you go see you Merrick. can you put us in Suzanne had to leave. Hi, David. I'm going to put you Hi. in another group. OK, thank you. Run. Some people are still coming back. Are they? I think we're all back. I'm aware I didn't actually say the duration of the session in the letter. I was sorry about that. Um, some people may have been geared up to a 90 minute rather than a two hour. Were you expecting really, two hours, Richard? I think the original was two hours, but I, I'm, yes. I'm quite happy. Um, I, I, we're really, I, 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 no, I'm not I trying really to. Want... No, no, no. I, 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 I've done actually what I want to do, and I'm really now. It's just a matter of qu any questions and answers. Yeah. What people found in that in the, that last breakout. Yes, that's good. So, um, go ahead, Richard. Did you want to start with any comments from the breakout rooms? Yeah, that's that's what that comments from the breakout room. Yeah.
your colleague David Mills was helping me to to uh, what I might do if I have a if I've, I'm faced with a patient who's sitting on the edge of the chair uh, and because they're, they're they're telling me something tragic and they're sitting on the edge of the chair and 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 how I might uh, I, I sometimes miss the opportunities to 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 do something about it. So David was your friend. David was giving me some advice how to do that. <laughs> He's upstaged you on that one, Richard. <laughs> you want to say, David, yourself? <laughs> well, the the question was one of whether it's whether it's best to have that posture of of acceptance, that general general one, or or to mirror mirror the other person. And as you said, if 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 those aren't in sync, that can be threatening. So I, I just suggested the idea of beginning with the mirroring and then and then easing yourself back out of it as a as an implicit invitation to follow you. And if you if you mirror where they are clearly enough with your own attention to where you know you're going next in mind, then it's an easier thing to get them to follow you. And then if they don't, you can invite them to come along. Yeah, thank you. Reminds me of Milton Erickson's utilization techniques. Mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. people may or may not be aware of that, but uh, he talks about uh, how do you hypnotize someone when they're pacing up and down the room and tensing themselves? Mm -hmm. When he gets with them, he says, right, you, you're feeling really tense now, you know, and uh, that's okay. And, you know, and then he'll lead them into relaxation or calmness or trance. Mm -hmm. I, I, want, I once worked with somebody who was sectioned for, and we, we had our lessons and 40 to 50 minutes of the lesson was me just sitting beside them at a, a, at a respectful distance until we, our breathings had sy synchronized and then we did some work. But most of yeah. it, that was just, just sitting and just picking up their breathing and not doing anything and, and maybe having yeah. a bit of a conversation as we go. But actually, one, it was only once we got to the point of actually okay we're in sync now we can work and, and um that's very that kind of building that rapport that way that ability everybody's got a potential for rapport it's a matter of um actually being able to utilize your own and utilize the other and i don't like the word utilize it's an ugly word for this but it's yes yeah. it, 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 it 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 does the job here um has anybody got anything else to report from the breakout rooms we discussed uh the we were intrigued by the dalai lama situation uh, yeah. i think actively that what if you're the person sitting next, standing next or two people down from the, the, the person that Dalai Lama is currently uh, in this uh, in the moment communion with, and you see that and you see them go to the next person, and you see it transition. And so you have this depth of rapport and then suddenly it's gone. And you kind of wonder, was that a real depth of rapport or was it um, a, a fake depth of rapport? Such a difference, but is there a thing like a real rapport or a fake rapport that's not what we went on to discuss, but what comes up to me just now. I, I, in, the, in the book, there's a story of somebody who meets the Dalai Lama and apparently for at least six months is utterly changed. I think that they, may, they then have reverted to his habits. So it was obviously a very profound moment of presence. By itself, I think it creates the ground of doing some work. I just wanted to illustrate this. I just came across it as a story and it's a lovely illustration of something. Mm. Um, so, and I, then I think you're also talking about the personal meanings people take. Um, I've never very normally um, quote Rupert Murdoch, but he, um, he <laughs> said of the Dalai Lama, he said, he said an old man in the Gucci shoes. Um, he also wears a very nice Rolex, according to the staff at the National Library of Scotland when he visited. Um, make of that what you will. There are different ways to construe the Dalai Lama. Well, I just myself said slightly facetiously that I would be a bit careful being people with forehead to forehead contact in certain areas of Glasgow in the old days. <laughs> ne wouldn't necessarily be well construed. Um, it was called the Glasgow Kiss. Indeed. <laughs> yes. 
Yes. But possibly at more speed than the Dalai Lama did it. Yes, well, they probably had razor blades underneath their collars as well. So, um... well, I was really interested in the, uh, you know, the, the idea of acceptance and posture and how how that kind of dance might work between people and between client and and, and therapist. That is quite a complex and nuanced uh, mm. process. And as we came in, uh, came into our discussion a little bit more than just posture, but also, you know, political, social context, uh, cultural awareness, all sorts of things, power differences, maybe, all sorts of things, I think, which, which, which have informed how you can get a therapeutic relationship off the ground or sustain one. Mm. Oh, yeah, I think all that, all, all that counts. The even just the whole thing of direct gaze and where, which cultures direct gazes are mm. acceptable, where where actually you should avert your eyes. Um, I mean, I, I I have a client who who would, wouldn't give me any eye contact whatsoever, stared at the floor completely for m many months, and, and said, "I'm sorry, you probably think I'm weird. I have to stare at the floor. I can't look at you." And I said, "No, it's fine. If that's where you are, that's absolutely fine." And eventually, you know, eye contact started to happen. As other things start to happen, um, mm. Mm. but I think, I think days when you could work beyond six sessions, wasn't it? Mm. Well, I work privately now, so for other constraints, but yeah. Has anybody got any questions? Yeah, I've got a question. Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, relating really to uh, the posture acceptance and um, you know what you notice with your clients. So I was just wondering for you whether you'd noticed a difference working with clients over Zoom compared to when they come into the therapy room because they they tend to be in in their own home. Uh, you know, you know it's. It's a different environment. You don't see them walk into the room. They don't have to sit in a chair that they're not used to. There's all these kind of things. They're in a place that they are used to. Um, do you find that some of the cues are subtly different? They are different. In some ways, I find teaching, it depends who I, I'm going to divide between teaching and, and therapy. The, pupils that I've taken and worked with on Zoom in some ways, it's, there's a very heightened type of certain information coming through and you can do an awful lot with mirroring and an awful lot with great detail, but you need to use an awful lot of gentle humour and be very, very aware of where they might be. Um, and so you, you, it's a different. It, 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 it's 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 more visual. It, what I it's more visually tiring because you're processing everything much more visually. Than so, if I'm teaching someone, I've got my hands on. It's going through my hands. It's going through. It, it's a completely different process. Um, in terms of therapy, um, in some senses, you get more the information. I get more information watching the face because I'm utterly focused on the face it's straight yeah. in front of me so I've got more to work with and I can play with my own face and, and, and pick them up and, and build because you, you you've got such a direct thing going on um, it's nice to hear so, you say positive things about that because uh, I mean Robbie Foley earlier was saying just how difficult it is with Zoom because you just haven't got that total body communication it, to me it is but then i can listen to somebody's voice and i'll tell you whether they whether they're dropping their heels and the foot toes are extending uh -huh. uh, so, so my, my level of, of awareness is just that's what i can read at that level just by listening to somebody's voice um what they do i can just shut my eyes and tune in and, and i can tell you how they're coordinating themselves mm -hmm. uh and how they're moving so it, 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 it's 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 quite easy for me, but then I, I very special. I have all this Alexander knowledge in the background. Would you I've say been... you learned that from the from Alexander knowledge rather than just years of experience? 
Let's use the experience of Alexander Knowledge. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and working and working in myself to work out when I what but I got very interested very early on it's that thing in there that's there in Dewey about oh that little movement what does that mean what's the thought that goes with that mm. and then actually from that I would when I watch people I have a proposition will come up but oh I see that movement in somebody it might mean that and, and then that's how I I get my from my own that silent posture that Kelly talks that these questions are up um, and so it's a matter of, of, of conception and conceiving things and then trying them out and in the dance that's going on are there any more questions If, if not, I have one, I always say when people have when uh, at the end of a talk someone says there's any questions you should have some. Uh, so I've been practicing preparing some, uh, <laughs> and we have eight minutes. Um, what we talked about in the first breakout room and what we talked about in the second breakout room, mm -hmm. I see a relationship that both of them are sort of what is the physical movement that coordinates with uh, a, I think you call it a mental movement, or maybe you didn't call it that. Um, and I wouldn't call it either of those things anyway, uh, especially not with you around. So I can't I quite remember what, uh, how I would phrase that. Um, and I wonder if that, if you would agree uh, with that and what maybe was the difference, because it also felt we were talking about two very different things in the breakout rooms in a way I can't quite put my finger on. Uh, I would be interested in what you intended with that. Um, there were two different things because there were two different questions. I thought there were two different questions that would, might be of interest to people. Um, and that if you take those two different questions and you look at whatever experience you've had of today, maybe you'll find something that's interesting and relevant. And that would very much kind of, so they're both, those both members of your community of selves to have a look at and uh, in their purity and then see what comes out of them but the for my own reasoning behind them one is I'm genuinely interested in how psychotherapists coordinate themselves and move through sessions I've said with Alexander Technique teachers and how one of the things I was saying in in um, the breakout room I was in for the second question is I'm also fascinated about over the years not listen not constructive as psychotherapists I have to say but I've been around a lot of con psychotherapists and the way I've heard them talk about their clients I have thought I wouldn't want to be your client because of the attitude to, uh, the neurotic it's just content sometimes about the clients and I'm thinking well if that's what you're holding out of the room how on earth do you practice acceptance in the room um, there's that thing about how you hold your clients in mind and how you hold the people you work with in mind. So I really wanted to open up that sort of thing, both how it's embodied in the room and out of the room. And then with the first one, I just thought the face of the decision was a really useful way to get into just how a very simple movement like that affects your whole way of thinking and how you can go to Jung's psychology and how you can go to Heidegger's philosophy uh, and also to Hillman and Mayer and just actually just that whole thing that we can go from a very basic form of muscle sequence of muscle twitching right up to superordinate constructs really quite quickly. Um, and that's actually what we're doing with the people we're working with all the time. That's part of your job as a psychotherapist is to get to the superordinates. And when I'm teaching, I don't want people to align with my philosophy. I want to actually give something that I can fit that face of decision into a Buddhists or a Hindus or a Christian or an atheist or an existentialist. I want to take that bit of work when I'm working with somebody and, and fit it under their uh, superordinates rather than convert them to mine. Mm. Uh, I, I don't think we, the thing I, I really don't like 
um, is any time I work with somebody where I'm being asked to align with their superordinates in order that I can do some work with them. I really don't think that, I think that that's, um, I, if I if I go to you to be taught as a Buddhist, that's fine, but if I'm, otherwise it shouldn't really matter. Um, and we are into the last four minutes. Can I, I think at that point, yeah. unless anybody's got an, uh, thank you, Greg, for that question. Unless anybody's got an urgent last question, I, I think I'm, I really want to go and get my gin. Um, and yeah. um, I want to, th I want to thank, thank everybody for, for, for turning up. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you find it informative and I've got the questions to go away and think about. And I look forward to meeting you all at other events. Thank you very much. Thank you. Richard. Thank you from everybody. Good. Just before you go, let me just say that the next meetup will be, I think, in five weeks' time.